I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're speaking with author Kenneth Funderburk. He is the author of a thriller called Medusa's Lair. It is a captivating narrative following the extraordinary exploits of Chick Sparks, a multifaceted character who dives deep into the criminal world. The author's adept storytelling immerses readers in an intriguing mix of psychology, crime investigation, and intense conflict. Bind them together into a desperate mission. We are delighted to have Kenneth join us here today on Spotlight. We thank the folks at Authors Tranquility Press for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like him by subscribing to our channel. Kenneth, thank you so much for being our guest today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and talk to you about the book and things related to the book. Absolutely, absolutely. I love the character Chick Sparks. Tell me who or what inspired this character. Well, that's hard to say. I have big grandkids. <clears throat> I sing and paint and all this kind of thing, but I'm, I'm not the man Chick is. Chick's a uh, real singer and a real man and a great psychologist. So this is... It actually begins, <clears throat> I got the motivation from a true story that happened in Pensacola, mm -hmm. uh, where there were six men that planned on robbing a guy who turns out to be a part of the Son of Law enterprise. Well, they rob him and kill him. <clears throat> they thought they had the camera cut off, but they didn't, so they were caught the same day. Mm -hmm. In the process, they had stolen from him documents which were important to the Sinaloa enterprise in that area. And so <clears throat> the Sinaloa's crowd comes after these people. And uh, <clears throat> as it happens, one of the guys was having sort of a threesome. The guys come in and start shooting. They kill two of them. But they don't kill Susie. Susie gets away. And so it starts when they're, they believe Susie has, can identify these guys. So they go out to kill her. And so it starts out as a small pea in a big pod. But it gets very personal when she brings in Chick to help her figure out how to handle this situation. And so there it starts as a small thing, but it grows into a real personal battle between some of the parties involved. Yeah. And, uh, and that's the reason it goes from this small thing to a big thing where Chick and Susie manage to actually hurt the, the big enterprise. And that continues in the book uh, of Medusa's Lair. Absolutely. Medusa, one of the partners of one of the women in this book, becomes like Medusa by the time we get to the end of this book. Except looking like Medusa, she has all, she, in other words, she turns into a demon. Even though we, she's not a physical demon, she's every other way a demon. And so that's how the name Medusa's Lair comes as the story progresses and gets worse as it goes. Right, right. I love the idea of Chick being a clinical psychologist, a famous singer, a part-time investigator. It kind of feels a little bit like uh, the classic noir detectives in a way. Is that right. what you modeled him after? Yeah, he, you know, he's sort of like an unintended investigator. He, uh, He's a clinical psychologist. He, singing, by the time the story gets to the end, he becomes a famous singer. Um, but uh, he doesn't start out being a policeman. Or What he was is he helped the police department identify uh, the psychological stuff, how it can affect cases, identify people. So he was simply, when they called on him, he would help them. And 
So when Susie needed help, she called on Kenneth, and then we get into uh, his friendship with the police and DEA, and that's how he gets – so he's personally involved in that members of Sinaloa, Sinaloa have a personal grudge against him, and that's how he gets to be the center of attention. Absolutely. Uh, it's a, early and late in the tale, you get to the bank, mm -hmm. which is a big bank in Boston, worldwide, worldwide operating bank, which actually the three people who sort of run it, uh, Gilman and Larry and a guy named David, they also work with the Son of Law Enterprise as their advisors. And they also use methods which I've set out. Uh, how to, they laundry money on the side as officers of the bank. And I was thinking, how do you describe what they are doing and how they laundry money? Well, <clears throat> today all we have to do to see a similar <laughs> set of facts is look at Washington. And if you look at Washington, you see how large sums of money flow in and out without yeah. anybody knowing where it is coming from or where it's going to, and that's exactly the many methods of that's doing that. Sense. And I described some of them. For the folks at home who don't know where it, what it is, explain Medusa's Lair, will you, and what the title refers to? <clears throat> well, the tale refers to, as I say, it starts out with uh, guys from the uh, son of Laura trying to kill Susie, who they think has knowledge that she really doesn't have. And that brings in, she gets help, that brings in Chick. And in the process of him trying to figure out who's behind all this, as it turns out in the first book, he had a good friend named Ken Renfro, <clears throat> who was killed. Ken was otherwise known as a big businessman there in Pensacola. But what he really was, he was the, directed the investing process of the Son of Law for the Southeast. And he had this contact with the bank in uh, Boston. <clears throat> and part of the tale is that the real person behind him was his sister. Myra, she was the smart one, and she was the professor at Vanderbilt, uh, English professor. But she is the one that all of their life, she was the one that directed Ken, who was the guy who actually was a contact with the son of Laura Gain. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that's what the Medusa Lair comes from, his sister who turns in to be the person that actually, in the story, Ken is killed. Right. When you move from the first book to the second book, he was killed. So the several things that happened, but at some point, <clears throat> he didn't know that Ken was a crook until the end. Of course, nobody knew if he was dead or alive at this point. So he went to meet the parents. They called for him because they knew that he was a good friend mm -hmm. to see if he could help them find Ken or find out what happened to Ken, who in the minds of the area was a well-known businessman. He, on behalf of the criminal enterprise, <clears throat> operated legitimate businesses, now, which is, happens, you know, Money is fungible, and there's billions and billions of dollars, as we know, that passes hands. Well, that money doesn't go into the side of a wall in some jungle house. All money, one way or the other, good or bad, is fungible. Mm -hmm. And the money that millions and billions that Son of Law, which is the main one, <clears throat> makes right now off our border 
it doesn't go to some hole in the ground somewhere. And if you just look into the records, the <clears throat> value of their assets is in the billions. Now, that's assets that the government or people keeping records can find. Mm -hmm. So this is really a story about how the business is operated from a business point of view, even though it also has a lot of killing in it. But the yeah. killing, the book is related. It starts off where I mentioned it starts off and then it gets personal. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The warring Mexican drug cartels contribute to the book's tension and pacing. Yeah. What made you decide to focus on them? Well, because <clears throat> they're the ones that manage, as we see every day, the Mexican Central Law is the biggest one. You got several others, and they spend their time fighting each other over territory, as we set out in the book. <clears throat> so the first thing that happens in the story is that we moved to, to Mexico into the Central Law again, and uh, of course. They stay in a battle with the Zeta while well, they were trying to enlarge their shipping base, <clears throat> what places where they could bring ships in, send ships out to Veracruz, knowing that another Zeta controlled that. So they're sitting here meeting and planning that. Well, they send a barge, not a barge, but a ship in there to deliver some goods to see what happens, to see if they can break that control. Well, Zeta finds out they're going to attack them, but as it happened, got a hurricane coming. The captain of the ship finds out that they're going to attack him, and he leaves early. And so that's the first battle uh, <clears throat> in the book. Yeah. So it ends up the guy's fighting the hurricane, there's five of them on attack, R.I.B. kind of thing. Well, they get killed. Now you have a, another point of argument between Zeta and Sinaloa. Now, at the time that happens, the guy who runs the big bank named Gilman, Sam, was meeting with some of the Sinaloa financial folks in Belize, discussing one of those things they were talking about is what they're going to do about what uh, Sam called the uh, that church boy, choir singer, chick. That's what he, he figured, you know, any boy singing at church couldn't be too tough. Mm -hmm. So they deciding, of course, to <clears throat> do away with them. They've done too much damage. Uh, for two little people who don't amount to a row of beans. <clears throat> so they planted that, and then the other thing they do, which is important to the case, they've already killed Ken at this point. They have to replace him. Right. Well, they knew Myra well because she was the girlfriend of Larry, who was one of the three from the bank. He and she had been together as boyfriend, girlfriend, since they both met at Oxford and had a child together who appears in the story later on. <clears throat> so they decide at that meeting, which is at the same time they're watching what's going to happen in this shipping business, they decided that she was the one that ran Kenneth, and so they agreed they were going to slide her into that slot. So, <clears throat> as we go on, that gets to be important as to how Chick found the way to crack the case. So, it all, it's all tied together, and it's all tied together because of personal conflicts. For example, uh, <clears throat> Chick sang in several 
telethons, and in one of the telethons, he met a couple of the wives, met Larry's wife and David's wife. <clears throat> well, David's wife got religion and wouldn't let uh, her husband near her. Well, he thought that she fell in love with Ken. Mm. So all along here, his great desire is personal to kill Ken. And he tried one time in Atlanta during one of these telethons and didn't pull it off. Well, as we go on at some point, <clears throat> not necessarily in this sequel, I mean, in the sequence of the book, but Ken goes and sees the family, and the family hires him since they knew he knew more about Ken than anybody mm -hmm. to find out whether he was killed or whether he was still alive because they couldn't find any assets. They couldn't find couldn't find letters, found actually nothing in his where he lived that would indicate that he was a wealthy guy. Well, so that was a mystery. So they hired him, and he took the job. So it goes on the fulcrum of the case. has to do, <clears throat> and I've had this discussion, why did I use the chicken fight as the fulcrum of the case, which technically it is. Uh, so he goes to see Susie's mother, Margie, up in Anniston. And while they're there, she has a cousin who's a real tough guy, a chicken fighter, you know, just a regular crook, down in a Pensacola. <clears throat> well, Ken, of course, lived in Pensacola. Well, he heard somebody was trying to kill his cousin, Susie. So he meets with her and tells it took him a while to convince Chick that he had a source of information from one of his buddies at the chicken fight in Shreveport. Shreveport at one time <clears throat> had the only legal chicken fight arena in the country. So that's where they were going and that's where Ken, the captain of the ship, which was the yacht, which was used by the, and so we have the big yacht and 100 and, 50, 60 foot yacht is used by the, uh, may as well say the business division of <clears throat> Son of Lord. Well, the captain was a gambler, and all these guys around the chicken, he came to chicken fights, so he was a man with a big mouth and a gambling habit. And one of the guys that Gus knew said he, had some information. So that's how he finally gets to the chicken fight, finally meets this guy who essentially spills the beans on Captain, who actually is a captain that ran that ship for Ken when he was when he came to that area. Hmm. So they knew he knew by now that he didn't know, but he found out at that point where he was. He knew that the boat had, according to the rumors, was in Belize at that time. <clears throat> so he contracted with the family and he calls them and the family involves the father and the mother, a brother who's a doctor, and Myra, who is the main culprit in the case. She's the bad girl in the case. Mm -hmm. She also is a, a smart one because the business division is impressed with her abilities. So anyway, he calls a meeting with the family and goes through everything he's found out, not realizing she is one. She is actually physically associated with the Sinaloa game and the crowd from Boston. Mm. So he tells the family, including her, everything he knows and what his plan is. And of course, that sort of directs you toward 
how the case ends. So the fulcrum turns out to be information derived from a chicken fight or whatever, based on people. And that's true now. You can go, say, from Aniston to Pensacola and east and west, and everybody that fights chickens knows they know each other. Right. Without a doubt. Yeah. It's a, a small subculture, no doubt. So, you know, you don't find and solve cases uh, in country clubs. <laughs> exactly. You find them out there where it takes place with the crooks. Right. Most of the time who know each other. Yep. Yep. Like we said, it's a small subculture. Boston is part of your narrative. Why did you set part of the story in Boston? Well, there happens to be a case that uh, actually took place in Columbus here where it was involved with uh, <clears throat> something very similar to what I'm describing, where uh, a Boston bank there along with a couple of crooks had a guy here who never did show up for his interviews of court. I mean, he finally just disappeared. <clears throat> but anyway, he went around buying all the distressed property. Essentially, it was put into a church, which essentially was owned by that crowd, whether it was a mob or it, no, we never knew exactly who they were, although I had personal contact with the details. So it was a method of laundry and money that actually they raised, coveted by church contributions in these little churches all over the place that they run the money through. Through the churches to this guy, he bought this land and it was essentially held for or directed by a crowd out of Boston. And Boston is a place where there is this kind of deep activity, mm -hmm. along with other places, but certainly mm -hmm. Boston. Absolutely. What kind of message or theme do you want readers to take away from this book? Well, in the book, I have some, I throw in, throw in a few really religious zingers. Mm -hmm. And if I ever got to the uh, sequel, it has to do with here's a smart person who totally goes astray for what? For money. It's not the money, it's the power that she has to direct businesses, large businesses. And the ways they can do that, if you happen to own some ships, you can transfer titles on ships, you can transfer titles on planes in just many ways you know, the big casinos op operators, a lot of them, they'll own ships. That's how they hide some of their money. Mm. They buy ships. It's not a title in the U.S. If they need money, they'll just trade, sell, usually trade a barter for their ships, boats. So being able to think that you have the power of life and death and your hand on billions of dollars of money is a powerful thing. Absolutely. As we see, we don't have to look far. We just watch the news and we see the effect of it. It's quite obvious that <clears throat> if you go now and compare it, say, four years ago, the assets of Sinaloa are substantial. Mm -hmm. They're around the world. Yeah. So, so the message is a religious one. Uh, <clears throat> there is no way to have meaning in life uh, in that realm. Yeah. So you have the one or two, like the woman I mentioned, that's during the process, gets religion. Well, at the end of the book, I do have a little philosophical ending, you know, the last page of the book, 
uh, I don't know if you want me to go into that. So I have them sitting on the boat. And, <clears throat> of course, this begins with Chick singing the Messiah, the t- ton of solos in the Messiah, mm. with Columbus Symphony of Orchestra, in conjunction with the Al- Harvard Orchestra and the choirs. I used to sing. Well, I did. I'm 86. I sang with them until I was 80, mm. but I still sing. Anyway, I have them sitting there on the boat, sailing, and <clears throat> Susie says, you know, the Messiah has quite an interesting way of presenting the message of God. And she says, yeah, well, what do you, why do you say that? He says, she said, well, you know, Christ is the peace, peace unto you, the world. And so he his first song, his aria, is a, a message of peace. Yeah, absolutely. And then the second aria is a song of destruction. Mm. Every valley is made high, every mountain low. And the third aria by baritone is the refining fire. And so... Chick concludes, as I conclude, that this is virtually the story of the universe. No beginning, no end. It begins with death. You've got to have death and destruction to have creation, which has the refining fire, which is the history of the universe and man. Have you visualized this as a TV series or a movie? Yeah, it would make a good one. I think so, too. I throw in my other part. I'm getting too old. I may write it and I may not, but I, I would have the war between Susie and Myra. Mm. And essentially, the question is, when they get together or one of them is kidnapped, do you kill them both, kill them one? Or go to like Paul in the road to Damascus, where she simply sees the light. I'm not sure in a story which way you, one would be life, the other would be death. Yeah. If she changed, it'd be death because they'd kill her, but it would be life because she chose life. The real life. Yeah, very interesting. The name of the book is Medusa's Lair. It is written by Kenneth Thunderburk. It is an amazing story. It follows the extraordinary exploits of Chick Sparks, who is a multifaceted character, part-time detective, and full-time psychoanalyst, psychologist. You'll love the book. You'll love the characters. You'll love the setting. You'll love the story. And you'll learn about life, and a little bit about the underworld by reading this book as well. Ken, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Mr. Crawford, has been, been a real pleasure. Pleasure's been all mine, sir. I appreciate your time. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time, this time until next time, on Spotlight.